And a good morning to you, everyone. This is Russ Barkley, back once again with your Saturday morning research review. Hey, if you've been watching the Olympics, you probably have seen some of the athletes with ADHD have been doing quite well. Simone Biles being, of course, among the most notable there. But let's not forget Noah Lyles, who won the 100-meter men's race. Uh, and Charlie Hull, the women's golfer participating on behalf, I believe it is, of Great Britain, uh, also an adult with ADHD. So uh, a shout out to all these athletes, and I'm sure there are many more, with ADHD uh, on the international scene at the Olympics. Uh, as always, let's begin with some really terrible dad jokes. These come courtesy of the website fatherly.com. And as you can see here, the first one up is why are spiders so smart? You'll get this one. They can find everything on the web. <laughs> Don't you just love the wordplay? These puns are something else. So, okay, here's another one for you. What did the duck say when he bought chapstick? Put it on my bill. Yeah, yeah, we, we got to love that one. And, and then finally, what does a cow use to do math? I know you'll get this one. A calculator. <laughs> okay, uh, enough really bad dad jokes this morning. Let's move on to the five research studies I'd like to talk about this morning. Uh, of the many that were published over the past week to week and a half, I think there was probably more than 40 articles hit the web. Now, some of those are master's theses and dissertations published on university websites, so I don't talk about those. Uh, but there are others that are peer-reviewed in journals, and as always, I do like to take note of those being published internationally, not just the usual articles that appear most often in uh, the journals from scientists in the West, and particularly here in North America. So our first study is on the subject of disrupted gut harmony being associated with ADHD. Uh, in particular, this is ADHD in children and teens. Before we get into this study, which, by the way, comes out of a consortium of scientists from Poland and Israel. So, uh, first of all, why is gut bacteria associated with ADHD? Well, if you go into the article a little bit, you will see here that it says that Numerous studies have indicated that alterations in the microbial abundance, richness, and diversity are associated with neuropsychiatric conditions, particularly neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism spectrum disorder. Research has also shown that ADHD patients may often exhibit lower gut microbiota diversity. Uh, linked with the disorder. Uh, additionally, uh, we know that gut health is associated with brain functioning and development in individuals because there is an interplay between the gut microbiome and the central nervous system, primarily through bidirectional influences that have to do with the immune system, uh, with hormonal influences, and other interactions between these two. So there's a lot more research on this on autism spectrum disorder than ADHD, which is why I chose to highlight this study. Even though it's small, involved a sample of 42 patients with ADHD between the ages of 6 and 18, and compared them to 31 healthy controls. And they did an analysis of their gut microbiota, as well as of small chain fatty acids uh, in the gut of these individuals. And what did they find? They found that there was less diversity of the gut bacteria in those with ADHD and that there were lower levels of small chain fatty acids, suggesting that there, as in autism spectrum disorder, might be some link between gut health and risk for ADHD. Now, we have to be careful here. This is correlational data. As we always talk about on this channel, correlation does not necessarily mean cause, because it's possible, as we know, that children and adults with ADHD don't eat well. Uh, what they eat is more toward the junk food, high-carb, Western, fast food type of diet. 
And that may be the influence on gut microbiota diversity rather than consuming healthier foods, more vegetables, uh, more grains, and of course, uh, less uh, processed foods. So we, we don't know yet what the direction is here. It's possible that there's a link here between causation of low diversity in the gut and risk for ADHD in individuals. Could be that it's just a relationship between the two, or it could be that it's ADHD through its influence on nutrition that is impacting gut microbiota. We just don't know yet, but a very interesting study there. Now, the next study up, uh, I'm going to talk about only because it's one of the few studies of ADHD to come out of Pakistan. This is a study on the rates of parental psychopathology in children with ADHD. Now, this is not news. We've known for decades back into the 1960s, so thanks to the work of Dennis Cantwell and others back then, that children with ADHD have higher rates of various psychiatric disorders among their parents and first degree relatives. Uh, and that is, of course, precisely what this paper found as well. So even over there in Pakistan, we have not only evidence that they have ADHD, but that the findings from their research are mapping on to what has been found in the West and in other countries in the East as well. And that is, as this study reports, that children with ADHD had a much higher rate of psychopathology in their parents. Indeed, the rate of psychopathology was nearly 40% in the mothers, about 33% in the fathers, and 48% in the siblings of the children with ADHD, suggesting that parental psychopathology is much more common in these families. Most notably, it was anxiety disorders and major depression. Interesting that they didn't measure ADHD in those parents, because that probably would have been the most common disorder. All this suggests is that there are, are genetic relationships between parental psychopathology and psychopathology, specifically ADHD in the children. And so we can, of course, see this as yet more evidence for the familial and likely genetic transmission of these disorders. But a nice study there out of Pakistan. Uh, the next one up, a very different study, this one out of Brazil, uh, and included one of my friends down there who is uh, Luis Rode. And this study is looking at the effects of transcranial direct current stimulation over the frontal lobe and its effect on inattention in adults with ADHD. Now, it's a small study involved 29 patients with ADHD, but they also did neuroimaging on these individuals to look at the size, the volume of different structures in the frontal lobe. And then they looked at whether or not response to this kind of treatment, this low intensity electric current applied to the scalp that influences the underlying brain area, whether or not the size of the brain had any effects on treatment response. Uh, and of course it did. They found that the 14 patients who underwent the transcranial direct stimulation over the left dorsolateral frontal cortex, we know that's involved in ADHD, that compared to those who receive sham direct current stimulation, which is fake stimulation, those who got the true stimulation did show improvement in an attention shortly after the course of treatment. This doesn't mean that it lasts much beyond that, but that immediate treatment seems to have a positive effect. They did find that those who benefited the most had the smallest regions in the dorsolateral left prefrontal cortex. So uh, some suggestion there that the smaller the brain happens to be in that particular area, the greater the likelihood that they will respond to this kind of experimental treatment. I'm not recommending this treatment at this time. I don't think there's a, enough research on it, 
that, that shows positive benefits, particularly over the long term from this, but it's a nice experimental protocol suggesting that this kind of treatment might be useful at improving inattention, and especially in those with smaller brain structures in that left frontal lobe. My next paper is on exploring the link between toxic metal exposure and ADHD. This is a systematic review that comes out of Iran, which is why I'm going to focus on it. Uh, its findings, again, are not especially new. It's a type of comprehensive search and meta-analysis of the literature we have known going back to the 70s that exposure to lead and possibly to mercury does increase risk for ADHD. Once again, these are correlations we're talking about. However, we do have ample evidence, both in animal and human studies, that lead in particular, and even mercury, are poisonous to the developing brain and may have some special affinity for disrupting the development of the prefrontal cortex. But nevertheless, what this study found is that there were many studies, 87 that were included in the review, and they found that of the 74 of those that studied lead, approximately two thirds of the studies reported a significant relationship between elevated body lead levels and degree of ADHD symptoms. They did not, however, find a link between mercury levels and ADHD. That seems to square very nicely with the earlier individual studies, and of course it would, uh, because it's a review of all of those earlier studies. Once again, showing that it's possible that lead exposure, particularly during the first three years of life, might increase risk for ADHD. But again, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, but there is some evidence of causation in other studies. My final study that I want to talk about is on the risk of neurodevelopmental disorders in the offspring of parents with major depression. This kind of fits with that earlier study I just talked about, about rates of psychopathology in parents of children with ADHD. In this case, we're going to go the other way around. We're going to ascertain parents with major depression, and then look at risk of various disorders in the offspring of these parents. This is a very large study. This comes out of Taiwan, and it involves more than 7,500 children with uh, parents who had major depression and 75, almost 76,000 control children and families. So they're looking specifically at a diagnosis of major depressive disorder in the parent. And what did they find? That the group that had parental major depressive disorder had elevated rates of autism spectrum disorder and more generally developmental delay, ADHD, intellectual disability, and tick disorders. Now, before you rush off and say, well, parental depression may be causing these disorders in children, keep in mind the study did not assess whether or not the parents had those disorders, autism spectrum, ADHD, intellectual disability, and tick disorders. We know from the earlier study that they're more likely to have these other disorders. So it could be that what we're seeing here is it's not so much depression that's the risk for ADHD, but that depression in parents is often comorbid with these same disorders in their children. Again, ASD and ADHD specifically. So uh, it's not a genetically informed study in that sense. They should have assessed for those disorders in the parents, but didn't. But again, it does suggest that at least parental depression is a marker of possible risk for neurodevelopmental disorders in offspring. Uh, again, that's not a new finding. We've seen that in other studies. It's just nice to see it now in an international study, this one out of Taiwan. So uh, in general, by the way, if you haven't noticed, ADHD occurs worldwide. Virtually every country that has studied this disorder in its population and looked at various hypotheses about ADHD, has not only found the disorder 
in the population, but is finding very similar associations with etiologies, with psychopathology, with impairment, and with other outcomes, as has been found in studies from Western countries and specifically North America and Europe. So uh, just showing you the international nature of ADHD out there and its now representation in our research. So, all right, everybody, thanks for joining me uh, on what is a dreary day here in Richmond. We just had Hurricane Debbie or the remnants of it pass over the city last night. So it's kind of a gray day here, uh, a good day for us to talk about research then and stay indoors a bit. So thanks for joining me. Uh, as always, think about subscribing to this channel if you like it and recommending us to others if you think they might find this information useful. And as always, when I sign off, be well, live well, and take care, everyone. Thank you for tuning in.